Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Well, it's great to see everybody again today, and uh, we're here with Herbie J. Pilato. Hi, Herbie. Hello, Art and John. And John, how are you hey, doing? Herbie, I haven't seen you. See you I haven't seen you in a month of Sundays, John. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm wearing the same shirt, all right, just for you. <laughs> thank, thank you, because otherwise, when you change shirts, it, sometimes it takes me a couple of minutes to recognize you. <laughs> hey, this isn't about me, Art. <laughs> no. Although, what do you think about my shirt? No. Herbie, <laughs> Herbie, this is about you, because you are the television expert. And, um, and I know, besides being an author, having written a dozen books on television, pop culture, things like that, you are a producer. You're a writer, obviously, but a producer, a television producer as well. And as a producer, you have a particular, I'd say, astute appreciation for other producers. And I want to bring up a name from my past, a guy, a producer that most people never remember, but a guy, a, a producer who did a whole bunch of shows that I remember well because he had a signature. And the signature was, besides the end of the show where they'd say, uh, Quinn Martin production, his signature was at the beginning of the show, they would introduce all the characters, all the actors, uh, by name. And it was kind of like featuring, it was like a stage play in a, in a sense. You, there was no secret about the fact that they were actors. And, and the announcer would say something like, and in tonight's drama features, here's a name from the past, Anthony Zerby as Bill Jimerson. And I, that's where I learned the, the names of a bunch of different character actors, Anthony Zerby being just one of them, who I could then become a fan of. And, right. and I, it's all due to Quinn Martin. Quinn Martin. Tell us about Quinn Martin. Quinn Martin, man, he knew how to please a TV audience. He was, you know, right there in the realm of Aaron Spelling when it came to one-hour uh, dramas, Aaron Spelling and Leonard Goldberg. But Quinn Martin's production had a certain sheen, and he said it at the beginning as well as the end. I, I think they just read it, at the, or you could just read it at the end. But he would say, The Fugitive, a Quinn Martin production, or the, the announcer would say that. The Fugitive. The Untouchables, which is considered really one of the most violent TV shows ever, but it was still quality. Uh, Streets of San Francisco, Barnaby Jones, Cannon, on and on and on. Each of those shows were mostly detective series. That was his thing. And yet the quality, too, between them had changed and was different. Barnaby Jones was a great show, one of my personal favorites. And, you know, I would do the opening with uh, the announcer, starring Buddy Up, <laughs> Lee Merriweather, you know, and then later on when Mark Shera joined, and then our special <laughs> guest stars. But it was a good show. It was written terrifically, and Buddy Epson was wonderful. And Lee Merriweather, of course, from Time Tunnel was fantastic. But The Streets of San Francisco... You brought things up a notch on that show. It was a Quinn Martin production, but it was, I think, a higher quality Quinn Martin production than that of Barnaby Jones. I think essentially meaning the scripts were superior. And the streets in Sa of San Francisco started Carl Malden. I think he had something to do with making sure that those scripts were better uh, than, than maybe he saw when he first did a weekly read because you know we're talking about a very prestigious actor he came from you know the mercury theater i believe oh no no that was i was getting confused with joseph cotton now joseph cotton did mercury theater but still carl malden was uh, uh definitely a prestigious actor and for him to do tv that was a big thing so he wasn't going to settle for anything less than than quality and michael douglas you know his co-star on the show son of kirk douglas I'm sure he wasn't going to put up with anything less than what he felt was quality. So The Streets of San Francisco, I think, was one of the better of the Quinn Martin shows. Um, the Fugitive. Ay, 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 ay. I know. 
Joe, I would say I would classify The Fugitive as the best one hour drama on te in television history. That's how well that show was done. David Jansen was fantastic. The scripts were fantastic. It was like an anthology series. You know, it would have, oh, yeah. you know, you'd have, you know, the Twilight Zone, which was an anthology, very obviously. You had the host introducing new characters every week in different stories. Well, David Jansen was this character who was a fugitive, wrongly accused of murder, and who went through uh, from week to week and met different people and ultimately changing their lives in some positive way. He was part of the story, whereas Rod Serling was obviously the narrator. But yes. uh, David Jansen's character was part of the story. Dr. Can Richard I, Kimball. Maybe you could uh, help um, uh, help me a little bit. By the way, I think uh, one of one of the Quinn Martin shows that you didn't mention, Twelve O'Clock High. Oh, okay, was a favorite of mine growing up. But uh, he's in a very exclusive club of prolific creators, producers like uh, Dick Wolf. I would say, yeah. uh, uh, although Dick Wolf, after uh, Hill Street Blues and a bunch of others, sort of got into Law and Order, and then yeah. he became a a variety of that and not in drama necessarily, but in comedy, Chuck Lorre. Uh, yeah. Uh, but he was he was there. I think Dick Wolf and he actually collaborated at one point uh, on a show or two uh, behind the scenes. But um, Dick and Quinn Martin? Yeah, and Dick Wolf at some point. Uh, I had taken a look at a wiki on it and it indicated that maybe he worked with him writing or something like that. But what... What is about these kind of guys, Quinn Martin being one of the first and one of the most diverse s series of shows, is particularly drama, how, how people like that happen? Because there are very few of them. <laughs> that is a good question. The, because there's a lot of talented writers and producers out there who work just as hard who have worked just as hard as Quinn Martin or Gene Roddenberry or Norman Lear or Chuck Lorre uh, or Aaron Spelling or Leonard Goldberg. How is it that certain people succeed and certain others don't? I mean, if I knew the answer to that question, I probably know the answer to pretty much every other question in the universe because those are, <laughs> those are, are unanswerable questions. It's, it's the luck of the draw. It's hard work. It, it depends on who you know. It depends on, you know, how, how much you want to sacrifice. I know from a personal standpoint, I mean, I, you know, I made it relatively later in life. We have my show. Then again, with Herbie J. Pilato at 58 years old, I got that show. But I not stopped working, but I did have a couple d detours. I took care of my parents or whatnot, and I had to put things on hold. So, I mean, maybe Quinn, uh, Quinn, like he was my best friend, he, uh, you know, just <laughs> totally focused. And, and I remember hearing a story about Roots, uh, Alex Haley, how he struggled um, in his career. And he made it relatively late in life, too. But he uh, would struggle with writing and then getting a regular job to pay the bills. Writing and then getting a job to pay, you know. Uh, to, to, to pay the regular bills. So there was, a, there was always that. Some people don't have to worry about that. Some people don't have to worry about their financial security. Some people have parents who support them or they come from wealth or they're financially secure, whatever. You know, like we were talking in, in a previous show about Michael Braverman. You know, he went into advertising and secured his life and then he went into the creative field. So with someone like Quinn Martin, who just had one after the other, all it takes is one hit. If you got a big hit, and if you can do it a, a second time, Hollywood remembers you. If you don't have a big hit on your first shot, Hollywood forgets you. So yeah. that's just you know, the truth. It, uh, Herbie, in discussing the, um, the reasons for uh, people's success like that, I include uh, what I call the John Wayne factor. John Wayne, a lot of people denigrate John Wayne. They, well, he wasn't a great actor, blah, blah, blah. But he was, I think he was a very good actor. But 
he knew what he could do best. He knew his character. And he always, sure, a lot of his movies are the same character with different words. But he knew what he could do. And he did that. He didn't try to go out of his uh, pilot house or whatever they call it. And I think Quinn Martin and all these other producers we're talking about have that in common. If you get a hit, look at Dick Wolf. Dick, <laughs> Dick Wolf, decide, besides his early uh, successes, he now is basically um, uh, the, the law and order guy, right? Law and order this, law and order that, law and order. Right. And, and I guess my premise is that when you have a hit, you build on that. You you don't you don't throw that away. You build on it, and you you do a sequel if that's what it takes, or you do something similar but different. Well, and well, the yeah, other thing is, when you have a hit, you have people around you that built that hit. Particularly as a producer, you have directors, you have actors, you have writers, and that family, if you will, it helps you build the next hit. Those are talented people doesn't mean that they're going to be perfect on every job, but it does mean that you can count on them. You know what they're capable of. And that kind of family, that support family, particularly in the world of television and movies, uh, is really important. Look at my, one of my favorite directors um, is uh, Dirty Harry. Uh, uh, Clint Eastwood. Thank you, Clint Eastwood. He works with the same actors. He works with the same cinematographers. You know, and uh, and yet his movies are completely different. But he's got a team of people he can count on. So I call that the John Wayne factor. Um, you know, not drifting too far apart from what you do well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, Gene Roddenberry, he had Gene L. Coon as a producer, and D.C. Fontana as a secretary, who then became uh, a story editor on Star Trek. And Star Trek was his creation, but he surrounded himself with A-list talent to lift him up. I mean, from a, an on-camera standpoint, Mary Tyler Moore did that on the Mary Tyler Moore show. She was a straight woman, you know? Her character, she played it straight, and she surrounded herself with an A-list of supporting talent that built her up. So that's what producers do, too. You know, they surround themselves with A-list talent and and because they're not stupid, they want the, their productions to last for forever, and they want their their shows to do well. So they're not going to hire, you know, unworthy writers and producers. Although sometimes that does happen on shows that still somehow succeed, and I won't name those because I don't want to go there. But <laughs> it it does happen, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, but it's really amazing remember? that uh, Dick. Uh... Uh, Dick Wolf, uh, Quinn Martin, Chuck Lorre, and some of the others, Roddenberry, uh, most of them never had a clunker. I mean, you have a lot of people out there who may have a great show one time, and then that's the end of it. You never see them again. But these guys just over and over and over and over. Yeah. And so Quinn Martin, uh, uh, I mean, he even came out with shows that may have not been as successful as some of the others, but Canon had a long run. Okay. Cannon had a long run, absolutely. A oh. Barnaby Jones lasted eight years. Right. Yeah. So, how many people yeah. get a one-trick pony for like uh, maybe two or three years, and then they go away, and then they never, you never see them again. But these guys yeah. are hit after hit after hit. So, what is your favorite? You were talking about uh, Quinn Martin and the Fugitive, but uh, uh, just maybe you can name a, a few other highlights of just things that would just so innovative and blockbuster that came from his uh, his brain well they they were so they were similar but they were different i mean you know barnaby jones was the older detective cannon was the, the heavy set guy uh the, the fugitive was you know he was a doctor um the untouchables was based on you know the real exploits of elliot ness in, in 1930s chicago uh, and both, by the way, The Untouchables and The Fugitive became feature films after that. So that was the first time that Quinn Martin Productions became feature film. Um, but the, the Barnaby Jones, as opposed to getting back to the whole Barnaby Jones um, 
uh, what was that? Comparing it to oh, Streets of San Francisco, they they still had different looks about them. Uh, they Barnaby Jones. Well, first of all, too, each network had a, had a look to them. NBC shows did not look like ABC shows. CBS shows did not look like NBC shows. So Barnaby Jones was on CBS, and CBS had kind of like a, a brighter light look to them. You could tell you were watching a CBS show. When you turned on the streets of San Francisco, which was an ABC show, the lighting for some reason was different. And it was dark, it was a little, little darker. And you knew you're watching an ABC show. The streets of San Francisco looked like an ABC show. Um, the Fugitive looks like an ABC show. Barnaby Jones looked like a CBS show, but they were all Quinn Martin productions. So I guess you have to have what a, whether it's an eagle eye, a crazy eagle eye like I do uh, for these kinds of things, or a, a trained eye in theater, television, film, whatever. But they are different. So they each were similar, such that they were produced by, by Quinn Martin, and they had a certain way of producing shows, like showing the guest actors at the beginning, and yet each was still uniquely uh, different unto themselves. Mm. Herbie, do you remember Quinn Martin's first success? Would you read? I, it was probably 12 o'clock high then, what you, you had mentioned, I believe. I could, I, I, I could be wrong on that. Uh, the Untouchables, I think, was the big one for me that I remember. Mm. Uh, it was huge, and it was it was violent. You know, I wasn't that crazy about the way they presented Italian Americans, um, and I'm not that crazy about the way they presented Italian Americans in The Untouchables either, uh, the feature film. Um, but it was it is it was what it was, and it was terrific, and it made a star out of Robert Stack. So yeah. Well, you know what, this yeah. has really been, uh, like all our conversations with you, are uh, not only amazing about the subject matter and, and very thorough, but uh, uh, who knew a different look? We could do a whole, maybe we could do a whole segment on the different watch, looks and the, changing, and the changing different looks over uh, the decades uh, for the networks. And uh, we should do a Dick Wolf and we should do a Roddenberry. So there are so many things that we can do that I'm sure that uh, we could just say, uh, Take it, Herbie J, and then put it on your one shot. <laughs> uh, but uh, so uh, uh, John, John, who's uh, who who figures out these things and sends all the notes around. John sent a whole bunch of stuff to Herbie J because uh, we could go on forever. Anyway, thank you, thank you for uh, just David, another delightful oh, episode. David Victor, Marcus Welby, Owen Marshall, Counselor at Law, another one, fantastic, okay. great. So thank you again, and we look forward to seeing all of you again soon. See you, everybody. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.